Good afternoon, everybody. You're all very welcome indeed to this special webinar event hosted by the Irish Institute for International and European Affairs. My name is John O'Brennan. I hold the Jean Monnet Chair in European Integration at Maynooth University, and I'm delighted to be joined today by our guest speaker, Ivan Krasta. I will formally introduce Ivan in a moment, but just to give you the format for this event. Ivan has kindly agreed to speak for between 15 and 20 minutes. And after that, we will move to questions and answers. So I invite those of you who have questions uh, that are prompted by Ivan's remarks to go to the Q&A function in Zoom. And those questions will be relayed to me and I will relay them then to Ivan once we get to uh, the Q&A. A reminder that today's session is a formal one, both the contribution from our guest speaker and the questions and answers are both on the record. And as always, feel free to join the discussion on Twitter using the handle for the Institute at IIEA. And now to formally welcome and introduce our speaker, Ivan Krasta truly needs little introduction. He has been an inspiration to many of us interested in themes around democracy, governance, and the European Union for a very long time. Ivan is the chairman of the Center for Liberal Strategies in Sofia. He is also a permanent fellow at the Institute for Human Sciences in Vienna. He uh, is also a founding board member of the European Council on Foreign Relations, a stalwart figure in journals like the Journal of Democracy. So he's followed the vicissitudes of democracy in recent decades as closely as any author could. He is the author of recent works, including After Europe in 2017, published by University of Pennsylvania Press, The Light That Failed, along with Stephen Holmes, published by Alan Lane in 2019, and his latest book, upon which today's talk is based, a very provocative reading of the pandemic and its impact on Europe, is it tomorrow yet paradoxes of the pandemic. So we are really, really grateful to Ivan for giving up his time to us today. And I now invite him to address us, Ivan. Thank you very much, and thank you very much for the generous presentation and the opportunity to talk. And I have learned that out of these Zoom conversations, the most important is to be as brief and clear as possible so we can have a discussion. Uh, the book uh, that you referred to, Is It Tomorrow Yet?, was written in 2020. It was after the first basically 100 days of the pandemic. So what I decided to do today is basically to comment on five or six things that I find puzzling about these pandemics. Because I have the feeling that when we try to see it from the point of view of what we find strange, which we find unexpected, probably this is going to tell us slightly more about certain changes that we're going to see. And when we talk about these plagues, pandemics, and I do believe that now we can talk about never ending pandemic and the way we have been talking about the never ending wars, uh, one of the interesting things is not simply to see what has changed, but also the changes that we were able to see, the changes that have been there before, but in a way we have been blind for. Uh, and uh, as a result of it, uh, uh, the first thing that I'm going to, uh, to try to address is this puzzle is that you remember when the pandemic started, one of the major questions was who is going to deal better with the challenge? democratic governments, authoritarian regimes. And now two years later, I do believe that most of us can agree that the nature of government turns to be a much less strong explanation for the success of the anti-vaccine, uh, anti-COVID policies than we expected when it started. You have a democracies that are doing fine. You have also some authoritarian regimes that are doing fine. But at the end of the day, it turns out that some other factors explains better how the countries are doing. And by the way, one of the interesting stories about pandemics is that who is doing better and who is doing worse, we should reevaluate every three months. Basically, countries that have been very much praised in the summer of 2020, then have been very much in 
the bottom in the summer of 2021. And uh, being in Austria now locked down, while Austria was perceived as doing quite well in the first year of the pandemic, so success and failure uh, are also very much uh, uh, questionable. And China is a great example of how successful they are basically locking down the country totally and closing it. Uh, but nevertheless, of what kind of qualifications we do, the unexpected thing that came is that the nature of the regime is not the strongest predicator of how well you're doing. It appeared that three other factors probably are turning to be more important. Uh, one of them is the general levels of trust in society. And you can see it on all level. It is on the level of basically vaccination. You are basically on the level of uh, how confident the government was uh, uh, implementing one or the other policies. And these kind of levels of trust vary in a different societies and do not correlate easily with the nature of political regime. We have a democracy with a high level of trust, Scandinavian countries, Germany to some extent, and we have a very mistrustful democracy like the one in, from which I'm coming, Bulgaria is from this point of view, one of the places where we are not all performing on trust. Uh, the second is, of course, the efficiency of the institutions and not simply of the public health system, but basically uh, the institutions as a whole. What, for example, I saw in Austria was to what extent, uh, for example, Austrian army was critically important for the success of Austria when it comes to testing the population. So this is much more capacity issue. And this capacity issue, you can have also both in democratic and authoritarian contexts. For example, Singapore, Taiwan, different regimes, basically, when it comes to the nature of the regime, shows this type of capacities. And certainly, there was this major distinctions between Asia and uh, Europe, for example, and Asia and the United States. But while, of course, we can try to go for a much broader cultural explanation, the explanation that I'm trying to offer is much more simple. The difference between Europe and Asia is that Asians had the experience with a similar crisis from the last decade. Uh, so it makes a huge story to what extent you are prepared for this or not. Uh, I'm always going to remember some years ago, flying through Asia and seeing all these people with masks and having the feeling that you have landed on the moon, but it was also the result of some of the previous pandemics that went through uh, Asia and which basically make their governments much more prepared in many respects, by the way, also legally for this. So this was the first thing that uh, struck me. The second was that uh, when already in February, uh, the pandemic was knocking on the door. Uh, the Italian philosopher Gamben basically made this important comment that he said uh, the democratic regimes are just waiting for certain type of a crisis because they want uh, to establish a state of emergency and basically try to normalize the state of emergency uh, as uh, the way to deal with the problems of ungovernability of some of the modern societies. The problem is how true is this? To what extent really the governments are so much keen to have these lockdowns? To what extent the governments are really excited uh, uh, about coming with the policies that are going to show uh, their capacity basically of control? Uh, and here I'm going to give you two kinds of examples that struck me as I told you. When you try to explain the striking, probably you're going to see the obvious. One is why Russia is uh, shying away from uh, mandatory vaccination. Listen, Russia is not doing fine as a response to the pandemic. Uh, the figures are quite high. Basically, you have almost a million excess deaths in the country. Uh, this basically is affecting also the economy. Even uh, uh, during the autumn, Moscow had been closed for uh, two weeks. And you can see that uh, President Putin, but even the Russian patriarch, everybody was strongly trying uh, to push the population to vaccinate. But regardless of the fact that Russia has a vaccine of their own, they were the first one to have a vaccine, they have been very proud with this. So there is no the problem of the deficiency of vaccines. The population is not getting vaccinated. So if we think in terms of democratic authoritarian, we are going to believe that for Russian government, which otherwise not shying away from using force when it comes to dealing with political protests and others, the most natural thing is going to be to go for the mandatory vaccination. 
Obviously, this is going to solve some of the main problems. But on the contrary, the Russian government is insisting that they're never going to do it. And even more, some people started to talk about the COVID uh, federalism in Russia. It was because of the COVID that basically the Russian government gave much more autonomy to the regions to deal with the pandemics. And as a result of it, basically, you start to see the differences. One of the positive example was uh, the very energetic response of the mayor of Moscow, Mr. Sobyanin, but on the other, you basically see other regions failing. So why a much more authoritarian minded government is shying away? And here is my explanation. I do believe that uh, one of the biggest problems that authoritarian regimes face in the situations like the pandemic one is that if you try to vaccinate obligatory, and if you're going to fail to do it, this is exposing your weakness. And democratic governments can be legitimate even when they're weak, because part of their legitimacy comes from the way they have been elected. In the case of Russia, basically part of the legitimacy comes from demonstrating how much you're in the control of the situation. So as a result of it, you end up with a situation in which while you have quite high numbers of people dying, you have infections, you have a huge pressure on the Russian uh, public health system, uh, but the Russian government is not simply not coming with the idea of the mandatory uh, vaccination, but even more, they're trying to claim that Russia is a free country exactly because they're not doing this. So strangely enough, uh, it is not the freedom of speech, it is not the freedom of associations, uh, it is the refusal uh, to get people vaccinated that is allowing the Russian government to claim in front of their own citizens that they're giving them the right to decide to, to get vaccinated or not. And I don't know how long this is going to do, but I do believe this is very important because it goes against some of our major kind of assumptions in the beginning that you expect that authoritarian government are going to be much more decisive when it comes to things like lockdowns, closing vaccinations, while basic for democratic governments, because of the responsive nature of the regime is going to be uh, basically less ready to do this. And then comes the story why out of all places, Austria is basically locking down uh, and at the same time going for the uh, mandatory uh, uh, vaccination. So uh, are they not risking too much? And here is my argument why democratic governments, contrary to what Agamben believes, are not particularly excited about the state of emergency. Because the state of emergency on one level is very much weakening the opposition. It is getting people out of the streets at least uh, for a certain period of time. Uh, but then the government is starting to function in two modes, which both of them are very difficult. One is, if there is a dictatorship that existed for these two years in Europe, it was the dictatorship of comparisons. You all the time comparing what is happening in your country with the neighboring country. And every ordinary citizen basically is deciding on the performance uh, of the government based on how they dealing compared to the others. But secondly, in order to show to the people that they care about them, that they want to protect them, I do believe many of European governments went into a trap which can have a long-term implications for the way our democracies is going to work. Government promised to people things that simply cannot be fulfilled. We almost promised people that they're not going to die. Uh, uh, when you are basically seeing also the discourse of some of the European governments, and don't forget we're talking about the governments that are governing over very much aging population, uh, you have the feeling that this is treated as unnatural. So the idea of a zero risk and total protection when it comes to human lives, but also when it comes to the economic uh, uh, results, uh, created a very, uh, a very difficult situation for any government. Uh, because this is something that you cannot simply do. And this is why I do believe that uh, uh, the Austrian government did it because this logic of trying to show the people how much you care about them was driving them in this direction. Uh, but in a certain point, it can backfire and not simply backfire because many people don't like these policies, but because of totally unrealistic expectations of what governments can do for the people in a major crisis uh, can come from this. And then I'm going as a result of it uh, to the second, uh, uh, to the second basically problem that we uh, question that I cannot answer easily. And this is the question, why you have a, such a big gap in vaccination between Eastern Europe and Western Europe? 
listen, believe me, this is very much counterintuitive. Uh, European Council on Foreign Relations have been doing survey in the summer uh, in 12 of the EU member states. And what we discovered is that according to their answers, East Europeans declared that they much more have been personally affected by the COVID. When we have been asking people, did you personally experience in a severe way COVID? Did any member of your family or close friends have died? Do you ex severely experience the economic uh, effect of COVID? Majority of people in every single Central and East European country said yes. While at the same time, basically 70% uh, of the Dutch, Danish said no, none of this. 60% of Germans said none of this. 60% of French. So why then, and if you see basically the figures, Central and East European countries now among the countries with the highest kind of uh, death rates uh, uh, per 100,000 people, and uh, you know the, uh, the numbers uh, and the problems of the East European public health system. So how it happened that countries in which people personally declared that they had been very much affected, countries in which people basically have a very legitimate reasons to be hesitant about the capacity of their public health system to respond, why they do not vaccinate. Keeping in mind that uh, during the communist period, we have uh, uh, obligatory vaccinations for certain type of uh, disease, so all of us have been vaccinated by kids. Uh, and I know that people like to make a basically big <laughs> Uh, uh, kind of a generalization about this and the country is slightly different. Uh, but I do believe that uh, there are four factors that are interesting to take into account when we're answering these questions because probably this is going to help us also better to understand the politics of it all. One is that it is now quite obvious that the countries that was most severely hurt by the first wave of COVID were the most eager to vaccinate. Spain, Italy. So this initial shock uh, created a situation in which there is a broader public consensus that you should do it. Uh, from this point of view, Central and Eastern Europe was not affected particularly strongly by the first uh, wave because also the movement of people and Central European countries are not the most uh, the biggest hubs of globalization in general. So the provincial slightly nature of the Central and East European society helped us to deal better with the first wave. But of course now, for example, with the third, uh, uh, second and the third wave, we, uh, we have been suffering a lot. Uh, but uh, the absence of this initial shock, in my view, is part of the explanation. The second part of the explanation is that in some countries, and Bulgaria, Romania being an example, uh, uh, the electoral process in Bulgaria, we had three elections uh, for this year because we twice uh, the parliament didn't manage to elect the government, so we went for new elections, created a situation in which there is not a single country, uh, the single basically moment in which vaccination campaign was the most important campaign. It was always election campaign. And during the election campaign, it was not that parties differed very much of what they stay on vaccination, but they were much more busy accusing others for not having results than basically pushing people to vaccinate. Uh, certainly, we basically uh, have a data to show that the level of uh, consumption of fake news is much higher uh, in Eastern Europe compared with other places. But it is also the nature of the media. And this is quite interesting to see to what extent the very nature of scientific debate in which in order for science to work, by the way, the scientists should disagree between each other. This is how science works. Makes people very mistrustful because in a certain way, the moment they see two doctors not sharing the same opinion, they're basically starting to lose confidence uh, in science as a whole. Uh, and, uh, 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 but the two other factors that in my view have been underestimated when we're trying to answer the questions why all of us have been so less vaccinated than others is that you have an aging medical community. Many of young doctors that graduated in our countries went to work in Ireland, uh, went to work in Germany. As a result of it, for this older generation, some of these uh, new type of vaccines were perceived as much more risky. They were less ready to trust them. 
and basically they were much uh, less ready to push uh, their own patients to go and to do it. So this is the crisis of the medical community, but not simply the crisis of the medical community in the sense that they didn't manage to produce a single voice and to lobby of this, but paradoxically in Eastern Europe, the expert community in general is much more weaker to influence decision makers. We have a much more politicized and much more polarized governments uh, in which basically it is the governments that much more influences the position of the doctors than the doctors, the position of the governments. Uh, so from this point of view, this was very clear that in places like uh, Poland, uh, the higher educated part of uh, the population, which now sympathize much more with the opposition, were less ready to trust the government on medical issue, not simply because they don't trust science. Uh, uh, you should believe that because of the education and we know of other uh, surveys that uh, there is a positive correlations there, they should trust more, but because they believe that the governments are simply selecting the doctors that fit uh, uh, their political agenda. And the last and of course, probably the most important is the low level of trust in public institutions. When you trust nobody, why to trust basically doctors, particularly when it comes to things like this. And I'm saying that this divide is quite important and also uh, that from this point of view, COVID can have a very strong effect on our political systems because while uh, there was this recent study by YouGov uh, and the Cambridge University showing that in the last three years, before COVID and COVID, we have the decline of the populist attitudes all over Europe. One of the important things that is happening and which I do believe is still recognized by many is that uh, populism did not benefit it in electoral terms of the COVID crisis for the moment, just the opposite. But because of this crisis, the populist party have remade their ideological positions. Normally three or four years ago, when we talk about IFD in Germany or the Freedom Party in Austria, we're going to describe them as political parties which are very critical to the existing system and which are strongly advocating much more authoritarian and decisive type of government. It was very clear during the migration crisis. Now suddenly, most of these parties position themselves as the defenders of individual rights. Uh, very much endorsing anti-vax movements, very much saying that the government goes too far, be it lockdowns, be it obligatory. Uh, so as a result of it, we don't know is this going to increase their vote or not, but in my view, this is changing their relations with the younger generations. Because one of the things that ECFR survey from the summer showed very clearly is the younger people growingly see themselves as the major victims of anti-COVID policies. So this is not about their life, this is about their way of life. This is about closed schools, closed universities. This is also basically uh, uh, the freezing of, uh, of movement in Europe. And for many of these young people, basically the sense of freedom was very much related to the freedom to travel and particularly to travel cheaply. So I'm saying this because as a result of it, uh, I don't believe that necessarily the populist parties are going to benefit from this, but I do believe that we're going to see a different type of a populist actors. And in many cases, this kind of a rise of libertarian attitudes, both on the left and on the right, it was interesting, the anti-vaxxer movement basically adopted the slogan of the feminist movement, my body is my choice. Uh, this is changing European politics because suddenly now, this is the mainstream parties that are accused of being authoritarians because of lockdowns, uh, because of uh, vaccination. And I do believe it's going to be the same because of the green policies telling you want to tell us uh, what to do. You're very much uh, limiting uh, our choices. And just in order basically to finish, because I see that uh, I went much longer than it is, uh, I'm going to speculate that we're always at the end of the year figure out which is going to be the word of the year. I'll try to speculate which is going to be the year of uh, 2022. And in my view, this is going to be sovereignty. And the idea of sovereignty and sovereignty is going to be key uh, word, but understood in two, three very different ways. First, all these populist parties are basically going very much to talk about the sovereignty of the individual and individual choices with respect to the governments when it comes to the anti-COVID measures. Then the 
member states of the European Union are going to be very much talking about the sovereignty of the nation states versus vis-a-vis -vis Brussels, and to see this very much when you see what is happening in Poland or Hungary. But I do believe you're going to see in many other places, including France. And one of the interesting effects of COVID and the state of emergencies that are COVID-related is going to be that governments and basically states are going to opt out of a certain common policies declaring that this is a national emergency or national security issues. So suddenly nobody is talking about, for example, Poland or Hungary, or I don't know whom exiting the European Union. So this is not the Brexit type of a threat, but we're going to say Poland who said, yes, but we're not going to share European migration policy. Hungary, for example, saying, okay, but we're not going to share common policy with respect to China or this or that. So I do believe this is going to be a new dynamic a fragmentation of European Union that could be uh, uh, extremely important, but certainly they're going to be talking about sovereignty of the European Union as a whole. So the idea of the strategic autonomy, very much favored by uh, President Macron, because also as a result of the COVID, uh, I do believe that the relations of the European Union with the rest of the world have changed dramatically. But let me stop here and during the conversation, I'll be very much happy to develop some of these ideas and thank you a lot for basically. Uh, invited me for this talk.